it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce Charles Eisenstein. Well, thank you everybody for showing up here for your trust in um, spending a couple hours of your, your uh, evening. Yeah, I was listening very attentively to, to Josie's story um, and the words like speaking, she said something like speaking truths, like they're truer than anything you ever heard before. And I'm like, oh gosh, better think of something fast here. <laughs> Because I thought instead, and like maybe I can do something else, you know, like <laughs> maybe a little bit of comedy improv or something like that. I, I, which actually, before I get started, let me do, do share an idea I had with you. I mean, like the next five years, that's the topic of tonight, it doesn't have to be grim, you know? Like there are incredible inventions that are transforming life. For example, artificial intelligence. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm maybe many of you are familiar with, with the tedium of uh, a lot of work in academia. And in fact, basic, basically, you know, the, the idea that we're going to replace um, tedious, degrading, and laborious work with uh, machines to do that part so that we can all do the fun part, like this is a very old idea. Hundreds of years ago, people were proclaiming that um, the, the steam engine, you know, or electricity, w or, or robotics would render work obsolete and usher us into a glorious future of leisure. And so AI has that promise too. And so, so applied to, to, so I know like a lot, I, I was very briefly sort of kind of in academia. Um, and like reading all those papers, you know, I mean, gosh, it would have it been so tempting if it had existed, to just feed it into chat GPT and it just, and makes like a little summary or maybe even like, you know, it has, if it has enough examples, it could do the grading by itself. Like, so, so like that's great, you know, it saves teachers so much work and at the same time, it can save, save students a lot of work too. <laughs> They're already using it to write papers, you know, like please write me a paper on such and such, right? So I'm like, wow, the, hey, I could do both parts <laughs> and education could be fully automated. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, so it's not all dark, you know? <laughs> and I want to... We all laughed at that. And that is significant. Because if there were truly no hope, then we wouldn't be laughing. There's some part of us that recognizes a possibility that justifies the laughter. Like it's not so serious, really. And of course, humor can also be a way to deflect and distract from what's real and in front of us. But there is a truth in humor as well. There is a truth in the joke. When all else fails in a time of conflict, such as our time today, if you can at least laugh together, then there's a chance of peace. Because to, to share a joke says, yeah, we're not really taking all that so seriously. There's another reality that we're both standing in that we can laugh at it. We are coming into very turbulent times when a lot of what has been hidden, what has been pushed aside, swept under the rug, the can that's been kicked down the road, and if I can think of some more cliches, I'll share them with you later. Um, when, when the chickens are coming home to roost. <laughs> when, 
and we're, we've been seeing it already happening, like for example, the, the um, recognition of the slavery and genocide and other horrors that um, were kind of like cut out of American history or not fully acknowledged, not fully understood, not fully seen. Those are starting to come back um, into the public consciousness. Um, the, the, the ecological destruction, degradation, that has also been, we've been kind of shielded from it because it's, it has been possible to avoid it. It has been possible to, and still is possible, actually. Like, I don't want to say that, that our transcendence of the current human condition is an inevitability that will be brought to us by crisis and collapse. It's not quite so easy. Some of you were there last night. I spoke a lot about this last night, uh, that, that it's a choice, that crisis and breakdown offer us not deliverance, but a choice. Which kind of sucks. Like, I've been hoping that, that like, it would just, we would just be rescued by collapse. You know, first it was Y2K, and then peak oil, you know, and then 2012, you know, and, and it's been one thing after another. Climate collapse, even. Like, there's, or financial collapse. There's, like, a part of us, at least in me, that, that kind of wants it to happen wants this deliverance, wants to escape the world that we have created for ourselves, that we feel stuck in. I think even that's why, why COVID lockdowns were so easily accepted by the population. Because we wanted out, you know? We wanted a disruption, we wanted a change. <clears throat> and that's not gonna come from the outside. It's something that we have an opportunity to choose. And when breakdown and crisis visit our society, then that choice becomes more obvious. Choices that had been unconscious become conscious. So those are the times that we are facing in the next few years, where old certainties and reliable institutions reveal their impermanence. So, where was I? I was talking about humor, the joke, standing outside. Yeah. Oh, right. AI automation. Okay, I kind of lost my thread here. Choice, yeah, no, I covered that one. Well, <clears throat> <clears throat> right, and, and, and that which had been invisible becoming visible. So we are actually, have, we have an opportunity to become sane as a society. Sanity meaning that we accept all of reality, not just parts of it. So these neglected parts of reality are coming back in. I'll share with you a, <coughs> a, a quotation from, uh, since we are in Boulder here, uh, Chagyam Trungpa, who has certainly fallen out of disfavor. But one thing he said was, if you can hold all the pain of the world in your heart, all of the darkness, while never lifting your gaze from the great eastern sun, then you can make a proper cup of tea. <laughs> I think we all understand what the darkness refers to. Positivity and optimism do not come from avoiding the actual situation. They're on the other side of that. However, if we only bring in that part of reality and not the miracles that are also, and, and, and the, the um, 
outreaches from a larger reality that are, that, that's beckoning to us, then we're insane as well. And we enter the pit of despair. I was uh, today uh, walking um, up in the mountains, and uh, it was actually in a town. And we stopped at this, uh, like this kind of thicket, these bushes, you know, which were full of birds. And they were pouring forth their song. Way more than they would have to if they were just marking territory or trying to attract a mate. You know, like, I mean, if you, if you just want to attract a mate, you know, and mate once, like, you don't have to sing that much, you know. <laughs> especially if you're a bird. But they're just like, maybe they've already made it. I don't know. Maybe they were new. But they're, 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 it's like, there, there is, like, even, okay. Really what I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about, is how to hold sanity in crazy times. So these birds are pouring forth their song out of their joy and exuberance of being alive because life is throwing, flowing through them so strongly that they cannot help but express who they are. At least that's my interpretation. Another interpretation is <clears throat> that this song-making behavior is the result of um, millions of years of survival of the fittest evolution because you see the birds that sing louder those attract mates more easily, and so their genes get passed down. So it's kind of like this automatic program that runs, and better for it to run too much than too little. That's like the evolutionary biology explanation. Like better to sing too much than too little. So they're singing all the time, like, like, like kind of a wind-up toy. Like, like, and and it, gives, it confers an evolutionary advantage for them to sing, and for them to look pretty, too. Like that's another story that we could hold about this. Which story is true? That is a choice. It's not an objective fact. Just the same as, are we going to, in 20, 50 years, are we going to be in a totalitarian, techno-fascist, ecologically destitute, concrete world? Or are we going to live on hippie planet? Are we going to live in, in a world so beautiful that, that even catching a glimpse of it makes you cry? What's it going to be? That question can be taken two ways. One way to take it is as a request for a prediction. The other way to take it is a request to make a choice. What world is it going to be? It's up to us. And that doesn't mean that we have to know how to get from here to there. The first step, though, is to know that it's possible, that there is a way from here to there. When we take in the information <clears throat> encoded by those bird songs, the knowledge of how to get from here to there develops inside of us. We may not be able to explain our choices, but life knows what to do. And the more of life that we take in, the more related and intimately connected we become, the more alive we are, and the more we know what to do. Life knows what to do. You know, they used to think that the, the genes coded for the structure of the body. They were like a blueprint for how to make a body. <clears throat> They're nothing of the sort. They do code for the building blocks, the proteins that make the body, but it's not like there's instructions that say this 
you know, this cell, you go here and become a liver cell, and that cell, you go there, and we have a whole plan for where, everybody is, where everybody's going to go. That's why when, when they, um, they take planarians, you know, flatworms, and they, like, cut off their heads, and they grow a new head. But if you cut off the tail, it grows a new tail. How do the cells know what to do? Each one knows exactly where to go and what to do. How? Life knows what to do. I guess this is <clears throat> related to what Josie was saying about the mystery works. We don't have to know the path in advance in order to walk it. I feel like I'm kind of speaking a lot of abstractions here. Um, yeah, but what I want to point to is the different feeling quality of those two stories, of the story of, well, it's just survival of the fittest. The word just actually is a clue to the whole thing. It's dispiriting. It's just that. Like you feel different occupying those two stories. You feel different occupying a story of a more beautiful world and a story of techno dystopia. We are going to be offered in the next few years a lot of conflicting stories about what is real, what is true, what is happening in the world. This is inevitable because the dominant story is breaking down. <clears throat> the story of what a human being is, what the destiny of humanity is, how to relate to the earth. These stories that seemed to be working well for many decades, many centuries even. The story of progress, the story that the betterment of humanity will come from our progressive mastering of life and matter. That, that we will achieve paradise when we perfect our ability to control reality down to the nano level, down to the molecular level, down to the genetic level. When we get everything under perfect control, when we apply the same means and methods of engineering to society and convert the whole world into a data set, then we will have paradise and replace all the labor with machines for greater efficiency and mathematically, scientifically run society. This was part of the mythology that gave life meaning, that gave individual human lives meaning, and that spun off these um, sub-mythologies, these defining stories and narratives, such as the story of politics, the story of money. All of these are stories. All of these are agreements. And in coming times, that truth will become more and more obvious. Sense and meaning will break down along with the institutions that rest on top of it. And people won't know what to think. This is already happening. You see it in the proliferation of, of conspiracy theories, of like extremism, of fundamentalism. Because when, when the, the story of the people breaks down, People are desperate for something else to explain things. What's going on here? The old story that I grew up in isn't working. It's obviously not working. Whatever it was, America, land of the free and home of the brave, bringing democracy to the world, that might be one aspect of the story. The story of you know um, medical advances bringing greater and greater health to humanity every year, you know? Like chronic disease has increased from something like 5% to 64% now of the population is suffering chronic disease, like at least half of all children. Like obviously it isn't working. Even life expectancy is starting to go down. I mean that was, that was the, the triumphant proof of our success. Like lifespans were, were, were rapidly increasing for you know, the entire 19th and first half of the 20th century. Then they slowed down. So yeah, like, the, so the, the bigger stories are breaking down and people are like, well, I need another explanation. 
So this is the, <coughs> the, the insanity that we've already caught a glimpse of and it's already um, gathering. And as the breakdown intensifies, it's going to be way more of that. And I'm not, like when I said conspiracy theories, as if I'm assuring you that all of us would believe in no such thing and, and that it's easy to, to occupy a place of uh, reason and critical thought and then if you do that, you will not fall into a conspiracy theory. Like I don't want to actually disparage them in that way because I think that many of them, okay, and this is my opinion, um, but many of them actually illuminate shadows of our society that are otherwise not visible. That's my fancy way of saying that they're true. <laughs> <laughs> they can't all be true, though, because they violently contradict each other. <laughs> and obviously, it's becoming more and more obvious to most of us, though, at least, that the, the story that has been dominant is mostly untrue. So what do we do with that? How do you know like, which story to live in and live from? These are not just intellectual constructs. These are not just castles of opinion. They are, they are a state of being. As you can feel, like I mentioned, the different feeling quality. I don't know if some of you have may, maybe gone into some of the um, conspiracy theories uh, like that are a type of fundamentalism, really. They're not that different psychologically from other, other versions of fundamentalism, which is also on the rise. Mainstream religion is in the, on the decline. Fundamentalist religions are on the rise, whether it's Islamic fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, Hindu fundamentalism. There's a kind of an assurance there. It, there's a relief from the discomfort of the bewilderment of the not knowing. The core of sanity, the, the, starting, the starting point of sanity in the next five years is to be comfortable and willing to abide in not knowing. To hold paradox. Because paradox the message of paradox is to say that your system of truth is incomplete. And this paradox proves that. Do you run away from it? Do you try to just solve it? it is a true paradox is unsolvable from the terms of its construction. Here's a paradox. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible is actually inevitable. But it will not happen without the firm commitment and choice of each one of us. Another paradox. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible will only happen if not just some, but everybody chooses it. And it hinges on your personal choice and it doesn't matter what everybody else chooses. You can feel truth in both of these things, can't you? Yeah. So that's how to hold paradox. You feel the truth of both, and you don't run away from it, and you hold that question, which then magnetizes to you a larger understanding in which the paradox is resolved. And in this case, you know, the paradox has to do with what is a self. How are my choices related to the choices of everybody else? What is, what is the causal principle that we have ignored and denied in the story of separation that we live in? The story of a separate self. Like, that's who you are. This is the core of the defining mythology of our civilization. A separate self in a world of other. That's who you are. And the world is not a self. It's just the environment. It pervades our language, doesn't it? And so, of course, human betterment, human progress is to control the random forces of nature. 
to insulate ourselves. So as the, right, so to, so, so to, to, to be able to, to stay in the unknowing, to hold that empty space until something new is born within it, genuinely new. Because really, on a, on, on a subtle level, the conspiracy theories, the fundamentalisms, the totalizing discourses that we run to, that's another one. Like, to, to explain and see everything in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of capitalism, in terms of patriarchy. Like, each one of these lenses illuminates something. It offers a vision of things that we could not otherwise see. But they do not explain everything. And that, that retreat from that which we do not understand into a, a narrower and narrower box, that is insanity. And that is what we are facing in coming times. And really, like, I've maybe been kind of philosophical here, but I'm gonna, I, I, everything I'm saying is very practical. Or I'm hoping to, to draw it into something practical. The practical question is, how do we maintain sanity? How do we hold sanity, not just for ourselves, but for our community, for our city, for Boulder, for our country, for the world? And as the paradox that, that I referred to of it is up to you and it requires everybody, as that paradox suggests, sanity is a group project. Sanity is not something that you can hold by yourself. That is actually part of the insanity. That is part of the cult of the individual the story of separation. It's really hard to hold a story in opposition to the story that surrounds you. And we are immersed still in the story of separation, in the story of competition, in the story and what that story tells us about human nature and what that story tells us about uh, change and possibility. Like many people here have probably had an experience that does not fit into consensus reality. I was listening to um, Maladoma Somme of Water and Spirit, a beautiful book. He, he, um, I, see, I, I really urge you to, to, to get the book. And, and actually, as is rarely the case, the audio book is, is better. Because um, it's, it's, it's him. Um, he himself is reading it. Not even reading it, actually. He's speaking it. I think the book originated by recording what he spoke and transcribing it. So, like, powerful transmission. And he describes these um, Dagara uh, initiation practices that he went through personally. And like some of them, and some of the things he describes are impossible from what I learned growing up and with a scientific education. And not just a scientific education, but the, the um, unconscious philosophy and unconscious metaphysics that, that suffuses our education, our indoctrination. Our, our whole society. We got to take that stuff in. Like, like for example, um, his grandfather would ha had had a, a farm six miles away, and the animals would be subject sometimes to predation by lions or whatever, and and so he would lie down um, uh, in his hut. I don't remember exactly what it was, but he had like an arrow fit backwards into a bow. And he would go into a trance and kind of check on his animals. And if there were a lion, he would 
fire the arrow backwards through a hole in the roof. And so he did that one time, and then the next day they like go out to the farm and there's a dead lion. Can we take that in as part of reality? Or do we put that in a separate category? And I'm talking about, that's an example, like many people have had experiences of, of like healing from medical conditions that were considered impossible. If you or, you or someone you know firsthand hasn't had that experience, you're actually in a small minority. Most people have had an experience of, or, or a precognitive dream or like an incredible synchronicity that you just can't explain away. Well, you can explain it away. You can. You always can. And this brings me to the point that I've been dancing around. How do you decide which explanation is true? One time in, uh, <clears throat> when I was uh, in uh, teaching a class at Penn State University where my job title was temporary employee type two. <clears throat> because <clears throat> I, I was lower than an adjunct professor. Like I was, because uh, you know, I, don't, I don't have any, I mean I, I had no, I, I was totally unqualified um, by conventional qualifications anyway. Like I don't even have a master's degree. So I would, but somehow I found myself teaching this class and it was about the history of technology. And so I was like, okay, we're gonna learn about what science is by learning about what's not. Everybody bring a story into class that doesn't fit into scientific reality. So one kid after another after another shares these stories and they're kind of afraid to share them. What are people gonna think? It's not like, oh, I'm gonna get attention, you know, by sharing some weird story, no. Like people are, like some of them would come up to class after. Like one, I remember one frat boy comes up, like, um, and I, I hope I haven't offended anybody by calling him a frat boy. Because like, because <laughs> really, I mean, this is part of the story, actually. Part of the insanity is dehumanization, which is the, the foundation of racism, sexism, misogyny, exploitation of all kinds. Dehumanization. And I just dehumanized this guy by calling him a frat boy. But I'm kind of humorous. Like, you know. <laughs> uh, but that's the, why is that insanity? Why is that not just immorality or bad ethics? Why is that insanity? Because it's not true. Dehumanization is not true. Anytime that you are in judgment and saying, well, that person's just less than human because if I were them, I wouldn't do that thing. They're, they're like less of a full being than I am. That's what, what I mean by judgment. If I were you, in the totality of your circumstances, I wouldn't have done that. That's dehumanization. And it's a lie. And a lot of the hysteria and insanity that we see on a political level is exactly that. We are invited to dehumanize each other. We are invited to, to hate each other, to, to scorn each other, to, to, to join. It also appeals to a desire for for connection. Let's connect by ostracizing and excluding and dehumanizing those people. So it preys on a powerful unmet need for acceptance. That's the unmet need behind judgment is acceptance. Self-acceptance, acceptance by a group, and safety. Because if there's a witch hunt going on, if you don't conspicuously accuse somebody of being a witch, then maybe you're a witch. This is some of the insanity that, that we have seen recently and could see a lot more of in coming years. So, yeah, so I remember one, one story. Um, this kid, yeah, oh, like, so the frat boy, he comes up after class because he doesn't want anybody to hear his story. But the one I remember was, was, he said, you know, I had, when I was in sixth grade, we were studying the gold rush. And one night I had an intense dream in which I was, I, the dream was an entire lifetime as, or, you know, a span of years as a gold miner, as a prospector. And I went out there, you know, and suffered these setbacks, but then I staked a claim and I found gold and I hired people and then, 
and like he held, told this entire story. And they said, and then I woke up in the morning, I'm like, wow, that was a really strange dream. And he went to school, and at lunch, he reached into his pocket for a lunch ticket, and there was a hard object in there. He pulls it out. It's a $20 gold piece with a picture of like Pike's Peak or something that had been in his dream. So there's different ways to receive this story. Either it points to an intelligence in the world beyond our own that can influence what happens. In other words, a principle of causality that we may not understand, a mystery, that suggests, for one thing, that our despair over the future, our very rational despair that says any real transformation is impossible because look at the powers that be. Look at the military industrial complex. Look at the, the banking cartel. Look at the you know, satanic human trafficking elite or whatever, the Illuminati, the, the, the reptilian aliens, they have the propaganda, they have the money, they have the force, they have the surveillance. They're listening to this conversation right now. Like, what hope is there? Uh, and, and, and just the inertia of industrial society and things are getting worse and the tipping points and like, you can make an airtight case for despair. But does it take into account things like that? Does it take into account the most amazing, miraculous healing experiences that you've had or witnessed? Does it take into account that a gold piece can appear in that person's pocket? That's one story I can tell about that event. The other story is, and this is what I did in the class. I was like, Zach, nice try. What really happened was that you stole a $20 gold piece from your father's coin collection and confabulated this dream and decided that, oh, it just magically appeared in my pocket. And then you forgot that you even did that. That's what really happened. Because we know that objects cannot spontaneously appear. Things only move in the world when a force is exerted. That's what science says. When a force is exerted on a mass, then it moves. And the ascent of humanity has come because we've gotten better and better at exerting forces on masses. And that's why we live in the brave, new, happy world that we do. Okay, so I debunked his story. And every story that came up, I debunked it pitilessly. But then, I, I, and then I, I relented. I'm like, okay, guys, actually, I believe these stories. But notice how you feel with that other explanation. It's not just an intellectual construct, these stories. They have a felt component. They have a, a consciousness. They have a beingness. So here is the navigating principle I want to share with you for coming times. When, con when confronted with these new fundamentalisms, with these conspiracy theories, with these totalizing discourses, with, with all of these different beliefs, systems of belief, ask yourself, who am I? Who do I become? when I inhabit this story, when it inhabits me? Is this who I really am? How do I feel? Does it make me more energized to live my day? Does it, does it, or does it paralyze me? What's the feeling state? Is this a food that I want to take into my body? And maybe it might be something that you have inhabited for a while, but now it's no longer hospitable. And you feel uncomfortable in that story. A lot of people are feeling uncomfortable in the dominant story, even if it's still working for them. 
even if they study hard and get good grades and they do get a good job and they do buy a house and they get sick and they go to the doctor and the doctor does fix them and they send their kids to school and they excel and they don't get addicted to something or depressed or start cutting themselves and the story's working for them. Even then, a discontent, a discontent grows. And it does takes less and less of a disruption for the whole thing to collapse. And then they're in the space between stories where you just don't know what's real anymore. You don't know what to think. You don't know how to do this thing called life. You don't know who you are. That's such a sacred place to be. Many of us in this room have been there. And when we were in there long enough, maybe a new story arose. That's about to happen to a lot of people. And if you are fortunate enough to have some grounding in a new story and some allies to help you hold that story, even when it's under assault from the stories around us, from the economy that says, no, 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 what you're doing is not valuable. It says it in a very explicit way. It's not valuable. Right? Money is the representation of the story of value that a society holds. And your work with whatever, animal rescue, that's not value, valuable. Your, your um, organic gardening, that's not valuable. Your silent work taking care of children, that's not valuable. A lot of the things, most of the things that need done most right now are not valuable. So the story that you, to, to, to keep doing them, you have to know better. Otherwise, you're not going to keep doing them. You have to be able to withstand the pressure of the economic system and the social attitudes around you and maybe the attitudes of parents, teachers, institutions that are all telling you something that conflicts with the story that, that you know on a biological level is true. The story that is you. True, what does true mean? True, really. My understanding of it comes from like carpentry, where you true a line or you true a board. Something is true if it aligns you with something, beauty. Is, it, is that story true? Does it align you with who you really are and who you want to become, who you're ready to become? So a true story, that's a true story. It's hard to hold it without allies on your own power. And that's why I say that sanity is a group project. We remind each other of what's true. We hold the stories together. And when one of us is strong, we hold the story for our brother. When one of us is weak, our sister holds the story for us. That's the only way. And when you have a group holding sanity together, able as a group to take in all of reality, the darkness and the great eastern sun, which is what Trunkla referred to, meaning the, the infinite potential of life, the joy that is the, the ground of reality that we deviate from, but always ultimately come back to, 
You see it in the death process sometimes. That's the great eastern sun. The intelligence of life. The intelligence of all things. You hold all of that. Then you can make a proper cup of tea, which is precise action, correct action. And that translates into the very tangible preparatory work that brings into actuality a more beautiful world. And I know a lot of people are doing that work in this room. It could be something as, as humble, literally, having to do with humus, you know, as restoring soil, restoring water, uh, um, healing trauma, um, building community. These actions, these, these that, that come from the choice, ultimately, of what story you hold, because if you don't hold that story, it seems futile to do any of these things. They're a drop in the bucket. You know, maybe many of you have that story of despair that assaults you sometimes. Maybe sometimes you succumb to it. I know I do. I've, I've been, during COVID, like, I mean, there were like weeks and months at a time where, where it was just so obvious that my entire career was a litany of errors and, and that I was a parasite on society and like nothing I did was any good. And I, I, did I climb out of that under my own heroic power? No. I was brought out of it by my community, by people who held the story more strongly than I could at that time of what we're all doing here. Thank you. Maybe some of them are in this room. Maybe you sent me a, a message at some time at, that hit me at just the right moment. So many, yeah, so, so like this, like how do you keep doing your work? You, you cannot, because it seems futile unless you have allies. Or maybe there's some people who have incredible inner fortitude and they can hold it by themselves. Okay, maybe. There's some. I'm not one of them. But, but it sure does help to have allies in holding a good and true story. Because then you do the work that, is, that, that fits into that story and into that timeline and into that future. That, that invokes that future. And here's something else. It doesn't even... So how do I put it? Even when that work seems to fail, even when your marvelous organic farm is downwind of the uh, toxic dioxin plume from the train derailment, even when your anti-fracking campaign is sabotaged and destroyed and it fails and you spent years on it, even when, when your, your uh, crusade to um, protect children from uh, electromagnetic radiation pollution, or I don't know, there, I mean, any, any one of these issues, sometimes, it, sometimes, usually, it seems to have failed. And, and you, but you, you gave it your best anyway. Those actions are just as powerful as the ones that succeed in an alternate system of causality that understands that change doesn't just happen when a force is applied to a mass. I said that that was scientific, but actually that's not even scientific anymore. It hasn't been for 100 years. You know, ever since quantum A causality was discovered and things just happen. Like that really boggles the Cartesian mind. Like, this uranium atom decayed, and an identical one didn't decay. And they were under identical conditions. I mean, this is, this is done in a laboratory. Identical conditions. The mind wants to say, well, that one decayed because something made it decay. Something, something pushed that proton out of the nucleus. Right? Something did it to that. It didn't just happen. How could it? Like, atoms don't make choices. Maybe they do. 
like, like a lot of our, our intuitions that come from science are no longer even scientific. So, yeah. These, these seemingly failed endeavors operate on another level of causality. <sighs> they generate a morphic field. That's one way to put it. Uh, the, the theory of morphogenesis, which I like to quote it, even though everybody already knows what it is, if I may ask your indulgence, that any change that happens in one place generates a field of change so that the same change starts happening other places. Any act of kindness, any act of courage, any act of compassion generates a field of kindness, a field of courage, a field of compassion. And you kind of start to notice other people are kind of doing it too. Maybe it's across the world. Maybe, maybe it's because your act of kindness was recorded on YouTube and it went viral and inspired others. Like, that's one way it can happen. This alternate theory of causality does not exclude what we recognize already. But it's a deeper principle, because sometimes it just happens in a way you can't explain. And that means you don't have to necessarily capture everything on YouTube. And, and, it, does, and it means that, that the worth of what you do does not depend on how big it is. We need to be able to navigate according to something else than the metrics. Because then everyone ends up in a competition to be big, to get more followers, you know, to get more audience, to, to get a bigger platform. And we think some people have a big impact and some people have a small impact. You know, like in the, boy, am I going on so many tangents off tangents. In, in the story of separation, like maybe I'm a pretty important person, you know, because I'm reaching thousands of people or more. So I get to say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing something about it, you know. But what about somebody who spends 20 years taking care of their disabled child, which is a lot of people now. So many parents out there, their entire lives are consumed by caring for children with, with chronic conditions. Autism. The latest, I think, is one in 38 children now are um, on the ASD spectrum. All kinds of autoimmunity, allergies, you know, like, I mean, all kinds of things. Like, and you thought, you had an idea of what your life was going to be. Marriage, and family, and, you know, vacations, and all that stuff, and little league, or whatever. And instead, it is an endless ordeal of caring for that child. Nobody says what you're doing is important. Nobody celebrates you. Nobody says you're changing the world. They're wrong. Those choices radiate a powerful ripple in the psychic underpinnings of our world. People who are doing those things, the, 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 the lady getting paid $15 an hour in a daycare center, and no one is even watching, and she's giving extra love to those babies who aren't even being raised by their parents. It's not, not the parents' fault either. You know, I mean, here's a habit. Oh, those irresponsible parents, those yeah, you'd do that too if you were in their situation. Anyway, those, 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 those women giving extra love to those babies beyond what they need to do to keep their $15 an hour job. No one's even watching. No one's applauding them. No one's telling them they're changing the world. And they, but they are. And their, their choices are all the more powerful because they are making those choices in the absence of any ego benefit of, yeah, I'm doing some great thing. They're just pure love. These people are holding the world together. On the psychic level, we would not, like, people like me out there doing things that, you know, and I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not meaning to, like, 
denigrate what I'm doing that's not important. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's not any more important. In the system of causality that I am learning, learning, I mean, I can articulate it well, but it's not fully in my body. So that's why I say I'm learning it. In that system of causality, what I'm doing is not any more important than anybody else. That's just the truth. And many of you might be people like that, holding the fabric together so that people like me can even do anything. Otherwise, the world would have fallen apart a long time ago if it weren't for people like that. And the same thing for those failed campaigns that maybe were hopeless from the start, but you did it anyway because you didn't believe the story of it was hopeless. Another way to understand it, besides morphic resonance, is that such choices, such actions are a prayer. I imagine sometimes God listening to people's prayers, <laughs> prayers for peace, prayers for, and he's like, I don't think I believe you. Because if you really wanted that, you wouldn't be acting this way. So a prayer that is aligned with choices that might be lonely and hard is way more powerful. It is a declaration of the human being. It says, in a situation where nobody's watching and it would be so much more comfortable to just like let the baby cry. But I overcome my fatigue and I hold that baby. In that situation, that is what a person does. In a situation where you confront somebody who triggers you and instead of dehumanizing them, and letting them have it, you ask, what is it like to be them? Where is this coming from? You declare that this is what a human being does in such a situation. Okay, I'm going to share something that I think the times are okay now to share. Um, like during COVID, um, I saw what I believed was um, a brewing um, medical security techno fascist state. And I knew the risks of speaking out. I know what happens to people when such a thing actually unfolds in society. And so I was afraid to speak out. And I'm like, you know, like other people will speak out. Somebody will do something about it. We're not going to continue to spiral down into this insanity, you know? Someone will do something about it. It can't just stay like this. It's too crazy. It can't just stay like this. But then I'm like, I thought, you know, if I don't speak out, then what rational reason would I have for anybody else to speak out? And that's why I say that, 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 that cowardice breeds despair because I'm making a declaration about the human being, what a human being does, and it becomes irrational then to hope. Why would anybody else do something when I didn't do it? You know, I mean, that's how I understand what a human being is and what a human being does from myself. So this choice that each of us confronts in various ways every day has world-changing power because what it does is it shifts reality into alignment with what you have declared it to be. And that is why I say that this question, what is the world going to be in five years? It's not a request for a prediction. It's 
an opportunity to exercise our agency by making choices that are in alignment with a more beautiful world. That say, here is what a human being is. And one of our greatest, most transformative revolutionary powers is to see that in other people as well. It's the opposite of dehumanization. It says, I know who you are. I know why you're here. I know what you are capable of. I know that you are here to serve life and beauty on earth. I know that if the situation on earth were impossible, you would not be here. None of us would be. There's a, doesn't, isn't there like a kind of a logic in that? Like, we wouldn't have been put here if it were impossible. We're not being trolled by the creator. <laughs> that's part of the, that's one of the truths that is core to sanity. And when we see that in another person, we call it forth into being. It's not a trick. You have to actually see it in order to say it. Otherwise, it comes across as like, you know, some kind of false encouragement. To see it, you have to look for it. To look for it, you have to know that it's there. And our story can tell us whether it's there or not. Our story of what is a human being. In environmental discourse, there's like this self-hatred that has arisen. The idea that human beings are a plague on this planet. That the earth would be better off without us. But think about that. Does that mean that Gaia was stupid in birthing us, in endowing us with all of our capacities, our gifts for technology and culture? And we should be better off without us, really? Would you tell a mother that she would be better off without one of her children? This idea, yeah, Gaia will be fine, Earth will be fine, humanity might go extinct, but Earth will be fine. No, she won't be fine. What Gaia wants is, to, is for us to fulfill our purpose, not to abandon it. And our purpose is just what I said for the individual. It's to serve the continued unfolding of life and beauty on earth. It's to make this world even more alive. And some people are doing that. Asking, how can I farm in a way that makes earth more alive? How can I create in a way that makes earth more alive? That's why we're here. And that is a new story for, hum for, for civilization anyway. It has ancient roots in indigenous cultures, including our own. You can trace it back through wisdom lineages. But for civilization, it's a new story. And ultimately, that's the foundation of the story that we must hold together to anchor ourselves in sanity, in turbulent and crazy times. It's the story of the human being. The old story was we're here to conquer nature. We're here to transcend nature. It is progress to enter the digital realm, the abstract realm. It is a higher calling to be a scientist or a mathematician as opposed to a plumber or a peasant. That was the old story. No longer. And we are gathered here together to immerse ourselves in a new story. 
to be reminded that we're not crazy for holding it so that we're not alone in it anymore. So um, I would like to just do a little practice session in doing that, okay? It's going to be loud. It's totally not an ideal space for this. And I have no idea how I'm going to call your attention when, when I want to, but here's my idea, which is that you'll um, get into pairs, which is probably whoever's next to you, and first you will decide which of you is the most cynical. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. <laughs> that person, their job is to hold the story of a more beautiful world, to hold the knowledge unshakably that you and all human beings are here to serve life and beauty on Earth, and that it's possible, and that even if we don't know how to do it, we do know how to do it to hold the story of as you take in more life, you know what to do because you are life. You become more alive, and the more alive you become, the more you know what to do. You're going to hold that story. The less cynical person is going to occupy their cynical part. So we're kind of reversing the usual role here. The less cynical person, the more naive person, the more idealistic person, the more hopeful person, they're going to they're gonna find that part of themselves that, you know, sometimes does feel it's futile, it's impossible. The, the evil is too powerful. And it's a war of good on evil, and good is going to lose. And it's like that whatever, that, whatever version of that is for you, you hold that part and you ask three questions to your partner. I'm not going to tell you what the questions are. Whatever it comes to you to ask. <laughs> okay? And, and, so, and so this is practice in holding, in holding a story for another person. Okay? And I'll give you, like, and yeah, your answers maybe don't have to be very long, you know? Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. The holding of a story for somebody could be transmitted through touch. When you hold it strongly and you see the truth of another person behind the veils of judgment and dehumanization and cynicism and the distorting lens of what a human being is that we've received, when you really see them, you know what to do because you're alive. You know what to do, you know what to say in that moment. So let's actually have a half a minute of silence. Hopefully you've decided who's the more cynical person already. And the more cynical person occupy your idealism, your knowledge of what's true, of a more beautiful world, go into that part of you. And the other person find a question that disturbs you. Up to three questions, but it could just be one. What disturbs you? I'll give you five minutes or so when I raise my hand Fall into silence and raise your hand. When you see a hand raised, you raise, you know that thing? And yes. So begin. All right. Yeah, thanks, everybody. So that was, that was actually the Q&A. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like to crowdsource a Q&A like that. Uh, so, so, but... It, you know, in case there was something that wasn't covered. Um, I'll be available now to, to uh, 
you know, take any, any other questions or reflections that you might have. Um, yeah, let's just, let's just do that. Um, do we have a mic to pass around or should we just be vocal? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Uh, here we are. You got one. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So the subject of your talk tonight is something like I don't remember the title, but what are the next the five next years five years look like? Just that. It's like yeah. from here to the next five years, right? And one thing you said is the coming turbulence. <clears throat> and another thing you said, this is part of what came up in our conversation, was it's like this positing of choice. And one dichotomy is the propaganda, the techno-fascist, you know, descending state, the concrete prison, surveillance, dragnet, all that, and the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible, which some specific examples, regenerative agriculture, community, like what we're doing here, actually having face-to-face -face conversation. But I would love to hear from you a little more specifically if you could sort of dial it down in term, because I know that you want to be more practical in terms of what you see for the next five years. Because my fear, like when I succumb to fear, is that these are these are not these are coterminous. I, I believe that these two, these two, we'll just keep it to that dichotomy, will be co-extensive, and and that to me yeah. is more division and more turbulence. And I think. I feel like things are going to get a lot worse before they get better because the old systems that are crumbling are not going to surrender so easily. And I just, that's, that's the, mm -hmm. the yeah. you know, the, the, tension, the tension anxiety. So I just love to hear what you see. And I just want to thank you also, by the way, for your work. And, and I, maybe that goes, I don't want that to go without saying, like when you share what you went through with COVID, I want to tell you personally, and I know I'm not the only one, your essay, The Coronation, that came into my inbox somehow, probably through Zach Bush and then you. I don't, would not have made it without people like Zach Bush and you. I'm just giving a couple of examples that are other, for me, they're luminaries in, in the most, most light, capital L sense of the word. Like, thank you for speaking out. Thank, thank you, because there are so many of us, I think, who felt so alone. If it wasn't for you speaking out, I, 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 I'm sure that I would have succumbed. So I just want to thank you so much for your courage and for listening to your heart and intuition. Yeah. I hope that didn't displace my question, but I do want to thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Like, I don't think I necessarily have anything that illuminating to say as far as predictions, you know, that, that you're not already aware of. Um, if my understanding of uh, ecology and climate is correct, then we're going to see um, increasing derangement, derangement. Um, uh, instability uh, that comes from, I mean, the, the, the most alarming thing for me as far as the global ecosystem is the decline of insects. Insects, yeah. Well, I'm way, way more disturbed by that than greenhouse gases uh, or pretty much anything else. And the decline of insects, okay, so I'm, here I am. Uh, assiduously not answering your question, because I'm about to go off into talking about that. But, but anyway, I, I could go there, because um, there's something important there. But yeah, like, but part of my point is that, that well, no, that's kind of an escape from the question, too. I was, <laughs> I was, I was going to say that it's not a prediction, you know, like it's really up to uh, even in the short term. But certain things, certain story, okay, every story must be told to its conclusion. And the story of, of separation and all of its sub-stories, the story of, of money created by interest-bearing debt, for example, like all these stories, they have, they have a conclusion. They have 
a denouement. They have, they have like a, they have their arc, you know? And what that actually looks like, it could look so many ways, like economic breakdown. It doesn't have to be a full-on collapse. It could be something that kind of goes from area to area, and then there's shortages, and you start to get used to the shortages, and then there's bigger shortages, and in some places, people are actually going hungry. I mean, one in four American children goes hungry every night, actually. That's what I heard. It's up to one in four. On any given night, one in four children is already hungry. It's already happening. But it's still possible to insulate ourselves from it. So my prediction is that it will become less and less possible to insulate ourselves from it. It's gonna, whether it's from food, supply chains, water, electrical power, cutoffs, like all that kind of stuff, um, wacky weather, crop failures, like all that kind of stuff is likely to happen. Um, and it's necessary for it to happen in the next five years because it's what it takes to give us the choice that we have been blind to. Not to rescue us, but to make us aware of an unconscious choice. So it's like, just from, like, I know this is going to happen simply because of my dramatic sensibilities. Like, as a matter of good playwriting, it has to happen this way. <laughs> so, like, I, I hope that's not too vague. Um, And I'll, I'll, I'll also like indulge my tangent on um, insect death. One of the habit, insect death, somewhere between, um, depending on place, uh, the insect decline is between 80 and 94%. No. Yeah. Yeah, in total insect biomass. Like, do you remember what the bug splatter was like when you were a kid? Yeah. yeah. Case closed. <laughs> do you remember the lightning bugs? Yeah. Weeds all around the garden. Yeah. Right. Part of sanity is to acknowledge loss. We have so many ways to keep the loss invisible. Just, you know, pop in a movie, you know, or um, read about how everything is getting better, progressing. Or just habits of not feeling grief. But when I say to, to, to acknowledge loss, I'm, what I really mean is to take it all the way in. And that's what grief is. Grief is the physical process of knowing that loss is real. Then you're in reality. Like we are, like Francis Weller's work is really beautiful in this regard. Everything you love, you will lose, he says. Everything. Everyone, everything. You know, at the very least, because you're going to die. And if you are operating as if that were not true, you are insane. <laughs> Therefore, a society that does not have wholesome grief practices will go crazy, as ours is. Francis Weller. Yeah. Celebration also is an integration process. Um, that I'm not always so good at, to integrate, to integrate beauty and joy. You know, if you don't do that, then you're not operating with a full data set either in your body. These are important practices. You know, like those of you who are doing this kind of work, like either directly working with grief and celebration or healing people so that they are able to take in reality, this is every bit as important as, you know, regenerative agriculture or, you know, campaigning to stop fracking. I'm not going to say one's more important. The only way to know what is most important is subjectively. 
Not as a principle that you can tell everybody else what to do because that's more important. But you know what to do because your life. Yeah. That isn't even, isn't even what I was going to say about insect death. <laughs> what I was going to say is that part of the insanity also is to try to, is to it's part of this, this fundamentalism. It's to say, here is what is causing it. It is this one thing. Yeah. That's so much more comfortable to blame all of our ills on one bad thing. There's almost a relief there. And we're so used to that, the bad guy in Hollywood movies. That's, in any, most movies, the problem is a bad guy. You kill the bad guy, problem solved. You know, we have a decaying political system. Along comes Donald Trump, and you can almost hear the relief of finally here's something we can blame for the problems of <laughs> democracy. Now, granted, like he made it pretty easy to do that, but like, you know, still like that pattern, like you focus on the bad guy and, you, and, and everything else is invisible. So, so like a deteriorating ecosystem. Oh, carbon. If we only reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, all of our environmental problems will be solved. The one thing. And then we're in comfortable territory. Control something. And in, in all of these cases, and, or, or the decline of the United States, you know, Vladimir Putin. Like, that's the one thing. Or, or the 50-year decline in, in public health. Here comes a virus. And it's almost like a sense of relief. Here's finally something we can control. Maybe if we control this, we'll all be healthy again. No one said that out loud, but that's kind of the, the suggestion. So this is one of these, these like, um, almost universal patterns that, that uh, I mean, you can see how it even infects our efforts to change things. It's so comfortable. But that's the kind of transformation that we really need to step out of those patterns. Because insect death isn't caused by one thing. It's caused by everything. OK, another question. It's hard for me to see. These lights are really bright. How about someone in the way back? That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for letting me talk. Um, you and Bernie, I'm so thrilled to be here right now. And I, uh, our climate group read your book at my son's suggestion and enjoyed it thoroughly. The thing that I still kind of wonder about is, like I thought of a t-shirt that says, more isn't more anymore. And that's clearly the problem of underlying a lot of most of our problems, although I love the expansiveness and the quantum physics and all the things that underlie everything you say. But, so, capitalism has gone past the bounds of being checkable. And so when you, if you were to tell a person who's trying to think of something else, like I live on more, I'm living on retirement money. And because something makes more, I get more, I get my monthly allotment of an investment. Is the replacement for what we have a steady state economy? Is there a word for something that can replace that piece of it? Hmm. Dang, I, w I wish you were there last night. I talked about sacred economics a lot. Yeah, um, okay. But yeah, um, so fundamentally, this earth is incredibly abundant and can meet all of our needs lavishly. The problem is that we are over-fulfilling some needs and others' needs go tragically unmet. A steady state economy, I could say yes, or even a degrowth economy, but what does that really mean? Economy in this context, when you're talking about economic growth, it's, it, what they mean is growth in the quantity of goods and services that are exchanged for money. So you could have 
a wealthier society that uses money less if people are doing things for each other outside the money system. And it could be as simple as, as doing, like a lot of the work that women have traditionally done, um, taking care of children, like nurturing each other, um, preparing food for each other, growing food for each other. When I was a kid, my dad had an amazing garden. And like we, he produced way more vegetables than we could eat. So you know, all the neighbors got zucchinis. <laughs> as much as they wanted and more. <laughs> that was not, that kind of thing does not count in, um, as, as economic value. So you could have, imagine a society where, where, we're, where, where you know, everybody's growing gardens. There's gonna be less and sharing with each other. And, and, and there's gonna be a lot less being bought and sold but people are going to be richer in, in many ways, even in like the, the rudest caloric calculations. If we had a, 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 a society where, we're, where we put our hands in the earth, then we could far outproduce the industrial food system, which maximizes yield per, per unit of labor, not yield per unit of land. And we could do it in a way that increases biodiversity too. So that, that's just one example. So basically the future is that we become way more wealthy in many important ways. And maybe we don't have like houses as big as we do. Maybe we don't fly around to, to you know, go on vacation because where we are is dull. Um, and, and why is it dull? Because there's no culture anymore. Maybe Boulder's somewhat of an exception. But, but you know, like, there's nothing to do. So let's go somewhere. Like, like that doesn't actually make, serve, serve our well-being. A 6,000 square foot house doesn't serve your well-being. Well, for most people. Some people, maybe, like, you entertain lots of people and have guests and stuff. But generally speaking, most people in those McMansions spend their time in the breakfast nook you know, and like the den. So anyway, um, that, that, there's a lot more. I, I'll have the recording of, of last night's talk um, on my website at some point, so yeah. And, and am I being like hinted at that, I sh that we should wrap up soon? I'm not sure what the, uh, what the agreement is with the venue. Josie, do you know? It's five minutes till eight. Five till eight, we're gonna end at eight? Okay, so how about one more thing? And then, here you are, you're, you're yeah, this, this man right here, you can. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll say a couple parting words to you all. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you because my wife just introduced me to your work yesterday. <laughs> so, no, you read the coronation. Yeah, I did, I did read the, the coronation. Uh, I guess my question is, because this is something that like she and I talk about a lot. Uh, 2017, front page of the New York Times. Yeah, we UFOs. UFOs, that we are not alone. Right. And there are people in this room that are experiencers. Yep. How much time do you spend thinking about that element of our humanity? <laughs> well, glad you asked. <laughs> Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, actually. It's significant. It's, it's, that's, that's part of the breakdown. You know, that, that's like some of these, these realities that were not part of consensus reality, that were excluded. If you really take that in, then how much of like geopolitics really makes sense anymore? We're not taking it in. That's what I mean by sanity. We have to take it in. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Because right now we're living in a very narrow ghetto of reality that's socially enforced. It doesn't take in the good, a lot of it, doesn't take in the bad, doesn't take in the ugly, doesn't take in the beautiful. So we gotta take that in. Then we'll be sane, then we'll know what to do. And, and there's also like a, a, a readiness that is required in order to enter the reality in which UFOs are authentic. 
and the, the, the very fact that it was in the New York Times is a significant marker of a shift in the collective consciousness. They will continue to migrate closer and closer into reality. Because that article came and it went, you know, I mean, I, I was like, people should be screaming in the streets. Oh my God, <laughs> they're, they're, they're real, you know. No, nothing happened at all. So this is, but it's something waiting to happen. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll just say, um, I'm not going to take any more questions because I want to, you know, people are starting to get antsy. Some people have to leave. Um, and it's really distracting when I'm trying to talk and people are like filing out. I'm like, oh, they don't like me. You know? <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to do that. But I, I, I will just say, I feel like there's one more short thing to say. Yeah, if anything that I've said has um, had the ring of truth for you and a feeling of, of recognition and, and you felt also that you were not alone in that recognition that a field has gathered here and knowing that we were about to disperse, just take a moment to feel the presence of whatever reached you, to feel the presence of the agreement field that has touched us. And the part of yourself that knows that this will have an effect on you. And to be in trust and confidence that what, has, what was meant to have happened has happened. Even if it is a process of disturbance, disruption, anger maybe. I'm not assuming everybody here has agreed with everything I've said. But something's working. Something's working. And it's doing the work. And my prayer is that this this field that has utilized me to grow among you people in Boulder, my prayer is that this will be one of the ingredients to, that makes your communities and makes Boulder an island and of sanity and a nucleating island of sanity in the five years to come. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, yes. And, uh, Bum, 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 bum.